Welcome back again. We are going to continue. Surprise, surprise. Uh, <laughs> carry on, as they say. So, uh, excellent. Thank you, Coffee Cup. Um, so, just to uh, remind you what we are doing, we are looking at the uh, life of the Buddha to be. Yeah, we're looking at the Buddha, what motivated the Buddha to practice the path. Uh, uh, we have looking at a whole sutta on the motivations of the Buddha to be uh, the ideas of dying and death and sickness and all of those kind of things. Uh, and we're going to continue to look at the motivations of the Buddha that made him go forth uh, and to decide to become a monk. So far the things we have looked at are the things that are very personal. Yeah? Dying, old age, illness, uh, corruption have to do with your person and the things immediately around you like your family and these kind of things uh, and now we're going to look at larger issues uh, yeah like the world in general uh, this is a different reason for going forth uh, and uh, these are kind of two they, they are basically very closely related to each other obviously uh, but uh, there are the problems of our personal life uh, and then there are the problems of the world in general, the different ways of thinking about the world and why it is worthwhile practicing the spiritual path. And this particular sutta that I'm going to look at now is known as the Atta Danda Sutta. And it is a sutta that is not talked about very much. I have talked about it a few times recently and some of you may have heard me talk about this before. It is found in the Sutta Nipata, which is one of the books of the Kudaka Nikaya. Do you all know the Buddhist scriptures really well, or do you know them not so well? Not so well. Okay, so the, the Buddhist scriptures are five collections, yeah, five collections of scriptures. Uh, you have the long discourses of the Buddha, you have the medium, middle length discourses of the Buddha, the connected discourse of the Buddha, and then the numerical discourses of the Buddha. These are the four main collections of Buddhist scriptures. And if you ever want to read the word of the Buddha, that's where I recommend you go. Read those four collections. And most of the suttas that I've chosen are taken from those collections. But there's another collection called the Kuddha Nikaya, which means the small collection. The small collection is the biggest collection. <laughs> it's weird because because the small collection is like a, an extra, yes, yeah? so that's where you put in all the extra books. And there was always more extra, more extra, more extra, more extra, more extra. And eventually it became this enormous collection. This is like, the, the small collection is as big as all the other collections together, basically. Yeah. And in that small collection there are some books that are uh, very old. They have the same feeling as the early suttas. They are part of what we might call the early Buddhist texts. Yeah, they are really what you would call the word of the Buddha. And then there are large parts that have nothing to do with the word of the Buddha that are later additions to the Kudaka Nikaya. Now this particular collection that we're looking at now is known as the Attaka Vagga, the chapter of eights. And this is one of the most ancient parts of the Kudaka Nikaya. It's part of one book called the Sutta Nipata, which is one of 18 books of the Kudaka Nikaya. And within the Sutta Nipata is divided into five chapters. One of those chapters is called the Atakavaga. And this is what we're looking at now. And this is the, uh, uh, this, we know this is ancient because this, these suttas are also found in Chinese translation and they are recorded elsewhere. And this is how we can know that these are ancient verses. Uh, and uh, so this is one of those suttas, uh, Attakavaga chapter of eight. Usually they have eight verses in each sutta. This sutta has many more than eight, so I don't know why it is there, but it is still there. Yeah. So uh, uh, the uh, Atta Danda Sutta of the Attakavaga of the Sutta Nipata of the Kudaka Nikaya of the Sutta Pitika. <laughs> If you can't follow what I'm saying, don't worry. We <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, the name Atta Danda, taking up arms, uh, At Danda means uh, like a stick or punishment uh, or a weapon. Yeah, that's why I translate as arms. It could also translate as punishment uh, or you can translate as a weapon if you like. Uh, or stick is actually the literal meaning of the word Danda. Do you have such a word in Malay language? Danda, same, yeah? Punishment, oh there you are, see, yeah, this is, that, yeah, because Malay has a lot of Sanskrit words in it, you know? So there you are, Danda, exactly. 
So, what, how do you say it in Malay? Danda, danda. Okay, there you are. Good. <laughs> That's really cool, isn't it? Uh, and it shows you how powerful Buddhism was in this area a long time ago. It was very powerful in this part of the world. Before Islam came to Malaysia, Buddhism was the main religion here. Uh, and so it was very strong, the, uh, the famous uh, dynasties they had around this area, and also in Indonesia, all of Indonesia, this whole part of the world. Uh. So that's danda, and atta means something like taking up. So the people who take up punishment, yeah, stick, weapons, these kind of things. And uh, so uh, remember we're now think, looking at how the Buddha to be, how he reflected on the world, uh, how he thought about the world, trying to understand the world in the right way. And here he's seeing how people and beings, uh, how they take up these, take up problems, causing problems for everyone. So this is how this uh, sutta goes. And this is a Bhante Sujato's translation that we have here. Uh, and uh, uh, it says, Perils, peril stems from those who take up arms. Uh, just look at people in conflict. I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency. Uh, this is the first of a large number of verses in this particular sutta. I'm going to look mostly on the main, the first few verses, because they are about view, right view, and the rest of the sutta is really about the practice and then the result of the practice. The most interesting part is the beginning here. Huh? So peril stems from those who take up arms, you know, take up punishment or take up sticks or whatever. Huh? Peril, the Pali word is baya, and it actually literally means something like fear. Yeah, Fear is born from those who take up sticks. So when people in the world want to punish you, they take up arms, they uh, do all these kind of things, it leads to fear in the world, yeah? it leads to, uh, leads to a problem. Huh? So uh, is it possible to have a world where no one picks up sticks, when no one has punishment, there is no arms, is that really possible? Huh? And if that is impossible, there will always be fear, there will always be peril. Huh? This problem will always exist in the world. Huh? If we can understand the world in the right way, maybe a world without fear, without, without peril, without um, uh, these kind of terrible things. Maybe that actually is impossible. Huh? And of course, we know it is impossible. Fear is, a, uh, is an inescapable part of the human realm. Uh, everyone will have fear sometimes. Uh, everyone will feel anxious sometimes. Anxiety and fear are just two sides of the same coin. Uh, and I will, uh, in a second, I will explain a little bit more about why that is the case. Uh. So just look at people in conflict. The conflict here are people who are arguing with each other, uh, always quarreling with each other. Uh. Yeah, when people quarrel and argue, they often end up with punishment, and they end up with, uh, uh, with weapons and sticks, and they do bad things to each other because of all this conflict that we have. Uh. Now, one of the important things to understand about uh, humanity in any kind of world, conflict is unavoidable. Uh. Why is conflict unavoidable? Well, for many reasons, but one of the reasons is simply that each one of us, we see the world slightly differently. Uh. We have slightly different background, uh, we have slightly different conditioning, different parents, different past lives, and all of these kind of things mean that we relate to the world in different ways, and so we see the world differently. Huh? Yeah, and this is why we have different kinds of friends. This is why we have different people we like and different people we don't like. Yeah? This is why we vote for different parties, uh, because we see things in a different way. Huh? Yeah, and we think that our way is right, and the other person are wrong. Huh? Isn't that true? Huh? Of course we think we are right. How can you not think you're right? It's crazy not, of course you have to think you're right, yeah? So that's, otherwise you wouldn't do what you're doing if you didn't think you were right. So we have to think we are right. But the other person also thinks they're right, and that's the problem. And when we all think we are right, but we have different viewpoints, that is where conflict arises. And that means that conflict is inherent to the human realm because we have different viewpoints, different perceptions. We are never going to agree 100%. And so conflict is going to arise. And very often these viewpoints that we have, the perceptions that we have about the world, they relate to our sense of self. Yeah? This is me. I have this view. This is my view. And because related to myself, it is very important to us. And if someone challenges it, we're not going to be able to let go easily. Because these views are an inherent aspect of what we take ourselves to be. 
If you ask a Christian, you say, tell them there is no God, they're not going to like that. Uh. <laughs> right? I, they're not going to say, oh yeah, you're probably right about that. Uh. No, no way they're going to say that, because that is a very important part of their identity. Uh. Yeah, and if, if someone says to a Buddhist that the Buddha is stupid, uh, you're not going to like it, probably. <laughs> Actually, I probably just should shrug our shoulders, okay, think whatever you want, you know, I don't, I don't care what you think, but but uh, the, re the reality is that some of these views are very important to us, are very dear to our heart, because they come from the sense of self, uh, especially important philosophical views like the idea of eternalism, or that you're going to be annihilated when you pass away, uh, very closely related to, to our sense of being. And so conflict is inevitable in the world, right? Uh, and when there is conflict, because it is inev inevitable in the world, uh, it also means that the taking up of arms, the taking up of sticks, the taking up punishment, that too is inevitable, because it is an extension of the idea of conflict. Uh, which means there's always going to be fear in the world. Uh, you're always going to be fearful. It's impossible to get away from fear. Uh, yeah, because of conflict around us, watching TV, seeing the wars in the world, seeing the Ukrainians being invaded, seeing China saber-rattling with the U.S. Yeah, maybe the Third World War is around the corner. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yes, some people say yes, some people say no. Okay, so you're already disagreeing. Yeah, so that's a, more conflict right there. <laughs> It's possible, right? We just don't know what's going to happen. We, maybe, maybe not, hopefully not, but we just don't know. And this is kind of, it leads to a degree of anxiety. We don't want the Third World War. Imagine having the Third World War. It's going to be incredibly destructive and very bad for everyone in this world. I don't know if you can live as a monk or a nun if there's a Third World War. Maybe that's going to be really hard. Yeah. What's going to happen if you do that? Because people are not going to have the time to look after monastics, maybe. Maybe you're going to get drafted to the army. Well, I'm too old to get drafted to the army, so I can, I can relax. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all of these kind of things happen. And that is kind of very unpleasant, the idea that the world, conflict, fear, anxiety, all of these things are inherent in the world. You can't get away from it. It's very unpleasant. We always try to create better societies. We try to have more peace in the world. Uh, and of course, you can succeed to some extent. There are some countries are more peaceful than others. Some people are better governed than others. Uh, so there is some degree of success in these things. Uh, but it's never going to be complete. Uh, there's always going to be a residue, anxiety, fear, violence, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, and that is very problematic. Uh. And this is, of course, why the spiritual path is so important. Because the spiritual path then is about withdrawing from that world. Uh, that world I'm talking about is the five sense world, the world outside of us. The world outside is always the five sense world. Uh, and when you go inside, within, and you practice a spiritual path, uh, you're practicing inner qualities instead. Uh, that is why the spiritual path is withdrawing from that five sense world, withdrawing from that conflict, uh, and building up resilience, uh, and building up strong qualities inside instead. Uh, and as we do that, uh, we have a refuge from the world outside. Uh, the Buddha says in the suttas that Satipatthana practice, which basically is mindfulness of breathing, that is the refuge from the world. Uh, you withdraw from all of that. Uh, this is why the spiritual path is so powerful. Uh, this is why this whole change in view, understanding what the world really is about, is a powerful force to encourage us to practice uh, the spiritual path. Uh, so this is the only way. And of course, if you do practice the spiritual path, uh, you become a more harmonious person, and you don't, you don't take part in that conflict in the same way. Uh, you become a source for peace in the world. Uh, you become a blessing for the world, uh, not just for yourself, uh, but also for everyone else. Uh, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, to be a blessing for both yourself and for everyone. That's something very beautiful about that. Uh, and uh, certainly if I think about my own life, I would rather be a blessing than a curse. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's not nice to be a curse, right? So it's kind of, being a blessing is kind of nice, being a curse is kind of unpleasant. Uh, so once you see this, yeah, once you understand the world in this way, then he says, I shall extol how I became stirred with a sense of urgency. The urgency arises. Wow, that's what the world is like. I've got to get out of this. I don't want to be part of this. I have the opportunity now. If I don't do it now, when is the opportunity going to come again? The urgency arises from right view. 
the more right view you have, the more inclined you are going to be to the spiritual path. Uh, and you will feel that sense of urgency. Uh. Yeah, so understanding this is very important. And you don't have to read the sutta to know this is true. All you have to do is turn on the TV or read the newspaper, uh, and you can see it's all happening in the world right now. Uh. You know, it's in, just read a news article and you're enough to become anxious already here. Yeah. So it's all, it's all there in our face, in a sense. So what you have to do, you have to connect, you have to, one of the very important things about all these teachings, you have to connect the suttas to the real world outside. See the connection, because this is about the real world. So don't allow one to be in the realm of theory and the other to be in the realm of practical things. You need to merge those two realms. And when they merge, that's when it becomes very interesting. Yeah. Let's go on to the next verse. Sir. I saw this population flounder uh, like a fish uh, in a little puddle. Seeing them fight each other, fear came upon me. Uh. This is the Buddha to be. Fear came upon me, right? Uh, like I was saying before, the Buddha is a human being. Uh. He has the same kind of emotions that we have. He has fear. Elsewhere we have seen that he has uh, uh, he has attachments, we saw that in the previous sutta, being attached to all of these things. Uh, and uh, he has a kind of a love for the sensual pleasures of the world like everyone else. Uh, and fear, and elsewhere we have seen greed and ill will. Uh, so you can see all of this humanizes the Buddha. He is just like us prior to his awakening. After his awakening is a bit different, uh, but prior to his awakening he's just like us. Uh, yeah, again, very powerful. So he saw, but the difference between the Buddha and us is that Buddha has a very acute understanding of the world. He looks at the world uh, and he takes in what is really happening in the world in a very powerful way. Uh. So he saw the population flounder. Uh. Yeah, flounder here is like almost like a thrashing about, uh, yeah, being restless, trying to move, not really being able to get out of things. Uh. Like a fish in a puddle. If you have a fish in a puddle, the fish will thrash about, trying to get out, but there's nowhere to go. It's in a little puddle, right? Uh, there's nothing that the fish can do. Uh, and so the fish is trapped in that puddle. Uh, in the same way, we, the population of the world, all of us, uh, we are trapped in this five-sense existence. Uh, and we are thrashing about in this five-sense existence, trying to find a solution, traveling all over the world, making treatises with the neighboring country, trying to find peace, trying to sort it out thrashing around, being ever restless, driven by craving. Uh, and what do we get? Uh, we don't really get anywhere. There is no solution. Uh, there is a temporary solution. There is a partial movement towards something positive, but there's no permanent solution uh, in this realm of ours. Uh, and this is kind of really important. You know, humanity, we are very good at trying to create utopias. Uh, you have the communist utopia, you see what happened in Cambodia, where they try to kind of create a utopian communist country uh, and they ended up killing millions of people. Uh, you can see the madness of utopias. Uh. So in Buddhism we reject all utopias. Uh. This is kind of interesting about Buddhism. Utopias are impossible because according to Buddhism everything is always impermanent. Everything is always changing. Uh. Everything is kind of driven by this deeper um, underlying problems in the human mind of greed, hatred and delusion. And because these things are the most powerful forces in the world uh, these are the things that uh, we always want more, because we always want more, because we're never satisfied. There is no end point, uh, and because there is no end point, utop an utopia is impossible. Uh, the utopia will be used uh, in the service of greed. Yeah, Look at some of the countries in the world where they had tried communist regimes, like Russia, for example, yeah, they, uh, they were still a wealthy elite. The wealthy elite used the system to enrich themselves. Uh, and this is always going to be the case. So you, an utopia is impossible, whether it is a communist, socialist, capitalist, whatever kind of utopia. There is no final stage. There is no end point. Uh, so we are thrashing about. We have this five-sense realm, trying to sort things out, trying ever restless, uh, always agitated, uh, never finding a solution thrashing about in this realm. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, part of that thrashing about is that we end up fighting each other. Uh, and then, when the Buddha sees this fighting, uh, then fear comes, the Buddha-to-be, fear comes upon him. Uh. 
There's this nice simile that I always talk about in these uh, particular retreats I do, and this is uh, the simile that is found in the Portalia Sutta, the simile of the piece of meat, uh, the mang mangsapesi uh, upama, uh, upama. And um, this is uh, the simile of a bird that gets hold of a piece of meat. Yeah, for a bird, a piece of meat is very valuable. Usually a bird has to eat worms, uh, yeah, worms and grubs, a piece of meat. Yay! So happy! And a piece of meat here is basically a metaphor for the sensual pleasures of the world. Yeah? Finally I got a nice partner. Finally got a nice house. Finally have a nice car. Yeah? Wow, I feel so lucky. Yeah, got it. But then the bird flies off with a piece of meat. But because a piece of meat is so valuable in for a bird, other birds come after it. And they try to get hold of that piece of meat. And because these other birds are larger, maybe, than the previous bird, and stronger than the previous bird, they try to rip that piece of meat out of the beak, or out of the claws of that bird. And when they try to rip that piece of meat out, the other bird, either it has to let go of the piece of meat, or it may die in the fight that comes from that. So this is kind of the world around us. The world is that we are all looking for the same sensual pleasures in the world. The world outside is limited, uh, and because the world outside is limited, and we all desire the same things. Uh, have you noticed how everyone wants the same partner? Uh, yeah, if, if one person is attractive, many people think they're attractive. Okay, everyone wants that person. Uh, we don't, if, we are, if we are smart and we divide it evenly, there will be plenty for everyone. But no, we're not like that. Uh, we want the same thing, right? Okay, you have a really nice car. Other people become envious. I want the same kind of car, right? Or you have a nice house or whatever. Or we go to work. Everyone is fighting, trying to kind of get a promotion and they have office politics. Or we are trying to get, you know, if you are children, you're fighting over the toys or fight, whatever it is. And when your parents eventually die, you fight over the inheritance. Do people fight over the inheritance here in Malaysia as well? And the richer you are, the more they fight, right? It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, it's completely crazy. Uh, and, we dis and, this is what, and this is the problem with the world, because these things are outside of us, uh, because we want the same things in the world. We're all searching for the same thing, and the resources are limited. Uh, the resources are limited in the world. The economy is only so large. The pie, the cake is only so large. You can only have one small you know, segment of that pie, and if someone else takes more, you get less. And you say, don't take my part, and because we are greedy. It's never going to work out. Uh, this is why conflict is inherent in the society. And this is kind of very, a very fascinating thing for me, because once you understand that conflict, uh, uh, violence, and all of these things is inherent in the five-sense realm, there's no way of getting out of it. Uh, it makes the five-sense realm much less interesting. Uh, yeah? The soon as you have something, someone else is going to want it. Uh, as soon as you have a nice partner, someone else is going to want that nice partner. Uh, and this is the way it goes. And you will always be fearful of losing your partner huh? because they may find someone else as well. Huh? Anxiety, violence, fear, all of these things revolving around each other. Huh? So you start to feel a little bit, okay, maybe that world is not so interesting. Maybe there's somewhere else I can go huh? where I can find a freedom from those problems. Huh? And of course the answer is the inner world once again. In your inner world, because you don't share it with other people, because it's your private world, uh, there is no conflict anymore. Huh? This is the power of these spiritual teachings. Uh, you go to a place where there is no conflict, a place where you can actually build up good qualities, which is a real refuge uh, from the world outside. Uh, and that refuge uh, is so powerful and so wonderful precisely for that reason. Uh. So this is the, the problem of the world. And then even for the Buddha to be, uh, fear came upon him. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. So let's do a few minutes of meditation practice and then we'll uh, uh, do some Q&A.
Okay, everyone, so uh, let us take some questions. Uh, Lai, are you here? Are you here, Lai? It's not here, okay. He mentioned before that it was possible to turn on this aircon over here. Does anyone know how to do that? Uh, yeah, might be a nice idea. Sorry.
Okay, any questions, comments, ideas? Um, being new to sutta studies or reading or um, let's call it studies, uh, how should we go about um, like um, there's five nikayas and which one should we go for? Uh, should we start with Majima, Dika, Sanita, okay. yeah. What? Okay. Then that's that's the first question. Um, or should we should we look like should we read cover to cover and um, if that is, we should go Nikaya by Nikaya, then uh, how, how should we do it? Should we read one sutta, then contemplate, reflect, rather than like a story, you know, endlessly reading? Yeah. Uh, or secondly, should we look at it from a thematic perspective? Or like, should we look at just rebirth and then we look, look up every sutta that is relating to rebirth and then contemplate yeah. on <laughs> that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, I, it doesn't really matter so much how you do it. What matters is that you enjoy it. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah? Everything in Buddhism should be about enjoying. Yeah? And so when you read the suttas and you find that you don't enjoy a sutta, just skip it. Don't like the next one? Skip it. Don't like the next one? Skip it. Don't like the next one? Skip it. If you like one sutta in the whole collection, that's enough. Uh, yeah? So the point, the point is that um, in Buddhism, the, uh, you know, if we force ourselves to do these kind of things, uh, I mean, sometimes we have to put a little bit of effort into it, and you have to kind of put a bit of energy into it. But generally speaking, the idea of forcing yourself, uh, it takes away the joy of the spiritual path. Uh, it should be joyful, it should be happy. Uh. So sometimes you need to read things that are a little bit challenging and may not be joyful. Okay, so sometimes you read that. Uh, but generally speaking, it should be something you enjoy. Uh. So uh, that means that you read, if you don't enjoy it, go to something else. If it is neutral, you neither enjoy it or not, then well, then it's up to you whether you want to carry on or not. Then you can carry on. Well, a good place to start is a book called In the Buddha's Words. In the Buddha's Words. In the Buddha's Words. Uh, and this is a uh, compilation of suttas by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Bhikkhu Bodhi is number one translator of suttas into English. Bhikkhu Bodhi. And uh, this is a very nice, and this is exactly arranged, as you're saying, thematically. Uh, so it is thematically arranged, uh, and then it has nice introductions, uh, it has nice notes at the end to explain what is going on, uh, so it makes it easier for you to get access to, to it. Uh, that is a good place to start. Uh, another place, uh, another thing I would encourage you to do is to read, uh, read suttas that also are inspiring suttas. Some suttas are more like, um, they can be inspiring, but they're more like, um, you know, they, the Buddha kind of gives a teaching, and sometimes it can be not necessarily very inspiring. The Buddha's like, do this, don't do that. But there are, there are verses, for example. The verses can be very inspiring. Yeah? And uh, one famous book of words is the Dhammapada. Dhammapada is very, very nice to read. Another uh, interesting book of verse that might be interesting, especially for women, is the Terigata. Terigata are the verses of the elder nuns. The elder Arahant Bhikkhunis, uh, the fully enlightened nuns. Uh, Teri Gata, T H E R I, T H E R I G A T H A, uh, Teri Gata. So these are actually very inspiring, yeah. And uh, because sometimes it's nice, if you are a woman, it's nice to get some from some elder nuns, yeah. I can understand. I can make uh, understand that why that is the case. Uh, so these are nice and inspiring verses. Uh, uh, another thing I would recommend you to do, if you are interested in the suttas, it can be difficult to draw all the meaning out of the suttas. Uh, yeah? This is what I see as my job, is to draw the meaning out of the suttas. Uh, and it probably would be difficult for most of you to draw as much meaning out of these things that, as I am doing. Because I'm very used to these suttas. I know the meaning quite deeply. So uh, for that reason, it can be good to listen to people online, yeah, go to YouTube, find someone who explains the suttas. Uh, this can also be a very useful tool. Uh, and uh, there are lots of monks and monks of people, people who do that. I am one of the people who do that. You can go to our website in Perth, uh, bswa.org, uh, and you will find lots of, uh, uh, lots of explanations of many suttas. B -S 
bswa.org yeah. bswa.org and yeah Buddhist site of Western Australia bswa.org and you will find that there are many other monastics as well and lay people as well there is a actually a Malaysian man called Piatan you know Piatan yeah he yeah he came from Malaysia originally and is now living in Singapore uh, he's also one of the wizard kids when it comes to suttas and he's also very uh, very good with these things uh, and he has a whole kind of series of books on this uh. and then once you have done all of that uh, then you can start with the majjhimanikai i'd re recommend the majjhimanikai first of all the mid length sayings of the buddha first of all because they are full suttas uh, that have kind of a bit of background material a bit about the buddha how he interacts with people and then their proper delivery of a discourse at the same time. Huh? So Majjhimanikai, very useful, very nice to read. Huh? So if, if you do all that, then next time come back to me and ask what next, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Uh, yep. Good afternoon, Venerable Sir. Good afternoon. Um, my question relates to yesterday's uh, Sutta on the Noble Search. Yeah. Uh, I went back and I thought about it. Um, you, you explained that Nibbana was translated as extinguishment mm. just to be closer to the audience than the Indian audience than uh, whom Buddha was addressing. They, they already knew the concept of Nibbana. Yeah. I just wonder whether, how about the other concepts here, like um, because ni, ni, Nibbana or Nirvana over here uh, mm. means very different thing to Malaysian. Eh? Yeah. It's funeral parlor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> A very okay. successful one. So, <laughs> completely got no idea yeah. whatsoever <laughs> as to yeah. the word extinguishment. Mm. Um, how about these other concepts in that sutta about? Unaging, yeah. unailing, mm. undying, or uh, un, uh, this one I love best, uh, supreme century, mm. yoga, kema. Mm. I mean, were all these concepts already, they already know the audience then, for them to be like able to like catch it. Whereas over here, even now, so many thousand years later, I'm still thinking, what is unaging? You know what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, the, the undying was already known because the idea of undying was a very important part of that culture. Uh, amata, amarta was the, one of the ideas of the existing Brahmanical culture at that time. They wanted to achieve some kind of deathless state where they would exist forever after together with Brahma. The Brahmanical culture had this idea of an Atman, a self inside that was permanent. Uh, and the idea was to achieve a, death, a, a permanent state in unit, unified with Brahman forever, ever, ever after. So that was a very known concept at the time. So the Buddha, when he used that word, uh, he is actually using it uh, uh, in a new way according to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, in Buddhism it means you don't die. Uh, there is no death uh, in the sense that the dying doesn't happen. Uh, but it doesn't have the same connotation of existing forever after as the, you have in the Brahmanical culture. Uh. Uh, some of these other words, I think they are very obvious if you know Pali. You will know what they mean because uh, ajara means old age. So ajara means lack of old age. Yeah? If I say lack of old age, everyone knows what that means. Yeah? Freedom from old age, uh, you know what that means. Uh. So, um, uh, so in, in, Eng in, uh, in English, when you say, what does it say? Unaging? Is that what it says? The unaging? It's a bit unclear, but if you say freedom from old age, it's more clear probably, right? Uh, or freedom from sickness, unailing, freedom from sickness. So I think this is also a translation problem as well, how to translate in a way that is very clear, so it actually has the same meaning in, uh, uh, in uh, English as it has in the original Pali. Uh, but it basically means a freedom from these things. I don't, th I don't think these are concepts that necessarily were existing. I think the meaning is quite obvious once you, uh, once you read the Pali, uh, I would say. Uh, See, as yeah. you explain, <laughs> because I'm a Chinese, so <laughs> the the the, the so-called concept undying mm. to to the emperor, I think it's Shi Wangti or whatever, 
they do not want to die. I mean, he didn't want to die. Yeah. He actually sent off people to somewhere to get some concoction or herbs or whatever so as not to die. But actually, the undying is mm. freedom from dying. It's not that you live on forever. Exactly. So these are two different things. One is living on forever. That's probably what the, probably what the emperor wanted to do, probably live on forever. But in Buddhism, it's just the idea, because death is a problem. You don't want to have to die again. And there's many ways that can happen. One is to live forever. Another way is to stop everything. Yeah, yeah? Two, two different ways of kind of reaching that. Yeah. Thank you very much, because yeah. I, I can actually imagine how people can misunderstand. Yeah. Uh, these ideas. <laughs> people misunderstand all the time. This is actually a big problem, right? It's a very, very big problem in the, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you for yeah. teaching us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thanks. great. Good. Thank you for asking. Okay, let's uh, go on to the, carry on with a bit with the sutta again now. So, uh, so we're looking at these things uh, and uh, you will notice that all the way through, it, is, it may sound negative, but you will see that what I'm talking about, I'm talking about on the one hand, the one side which is problematic, and then the solution on the other hand. The solution is always the spiritual practice, right? Uh, so this is what I'm saying. And it's not, and this is not negative overall. The overall picture is kind of just showing you the direction in which we want to lean the mind. Yeah, this is the purpose of all of this. Uh, so it is a bit negative about the world, but I think sometimes we need a balance. Uh, but it is positive about the spiritual practice. There is a solution to these problems. Uh, this is what is important here. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next verse. The world around was hollow. All directions were in turmoil. Wanting a home for myself, I saw nowhere unsettled. So, um, the idea here, yeah, the world around is hollow. The idea of hollow is that there is nothing substantial in the world. There's no way you can hold on to where you will be safe because it will never change, right? There's nothing in the world that is permanent, that is always there, that you can rely on. This is a core aspect of the Buddha's teachings. And because of that, you can never feel safe. Yeah, wherever, Whenever you take your stand somewhere, this is one of the ways I like to look at this, whenever you stand down, you, uh, you, you kind of think you can rest. As soon as you take your stand, someone or the world comes and pulls the carpet out from under your feet. There is no way to take a stand. And that's kind of scary, right? And this is what it means. The world is in turmoil, always changing, always moving on, always moving to something else. And because we are human beings, we want stability. We want things that we can attach to. Why? Because we attach all the time. And when you, once you attach, you want stability. And the world is never going to give you that stability that you desire. This is the fundamental problem with existence. The reason that we want stability is because of the sense of self, ultimately. The sense of self craves for stability. Because once you have a self, you identify with something, and because you think that is you, once it changes, it becomes very problematic because you are identifying with it. The very idea that we identify with something means that we want stability within us, but also outside of us. And so when that stability cannot be found, it creates a very problematic situation for us. Yeah? The world is hollow, the directions are in turmoil, there's nowhere to stand, nothing to hold on to, nothing to attach to, nothing to grasp, nothing we can rely on in the world. The world is inherently unreliable. That's very unpleasant. And so you withdraw your interest from that world. You look in a new direction for meaning and purpose in life. And that is inwards on the spiritual path. And then the Buddha to be, he says he wants a home for himself. We all want a home, right? A home is a place where you can feel at ease, when you can relax, you can kind of, be, you know, you know what it's like to have a nice apartment, yeah? You have a place where you can kind of close the door and you can kind of enjoy yourself with your entertainment, you can cook, make some nice food for yourself and hang out with your family. Everyone wants a home because a home is a refuge from the world outside. We don't want to live under a bridge, right? In a cardboard box, that's unpleasant. We want to have a real solid brick and mortar home. But then he says, I saw nowhere unsettled. The meaning of, of, of this is something like, there is no rest. I saw nowhere where I can find a rest. This is what, it's a bit strange, this, I saw nowhere unsettled. But the idea is there's nowhere I can rest. There's nowhere I can really relax. 
Why? Because everything is in turmoil. A home, a place where you can really be at ease, that is always going to be safe for you. There is no such thing in the world. And so the Buddha has this beautiful idea of seeing the world as borrowed goods. Yeah, everything in life is borrowed. We have it for a while, then we have to give it up. There is no such thing as a home that we can hold on to. And once you start to see your life, the things in your life, as borrowed things, that is where you start to have a more realistic outlook on what life really is about. There is no home, there is nowhere safe, nowhere where you can relax and be at ease. It's kind of unpleasant, isn't it? Is the Buddha right about this? Or is he wrong? Do you want to hear this or do you want to hear something else? Do you want to hear something life-affirming or do you want to hear the Buddha's teaching? <laughs> Uh, anyway, so it is kind of, uh, you know, this is kind of the power of the Buddha to be. This is what makes him so powerful. He looks at the world squarely and he sees what is actually there. He doesn't see what he wants to see. Most of the time, people, we all see what we want to see in the world. Uh, but the power of the Buddha is the ability to actually be straight up about what's going on. Okay, then how do we deal with it? Uh, Yet even in their settlement, they fight. Uh, yeah? Even when you try to settle, when actually there's nowhere to settle, you keep on fighting. Uh, seeing that, I grew uneasy, or I grew discontent, or I grew dissatisfied. Yeah? This is kind of the point here. Arati, arati means dissatisfied, uh, not happy with what's going on. Uh. And then I saw a dart there, uh, so hard to see, stuck in the heart. Yep. We see people fighting all the time, even when they try to settle down, they still keep on fighting. Yeah. And the Buddha becomes discontent. He's already said that he's fearful, now he's discontent. He doesn't want to have anything to do with this anymore. Yeah, You want to get rid of all of that. Uh, and then he looks more carefully, and what he's looking for next uh, is the cause for all of these things. Yeah, and This is kind of the dart. The dart is the cause that lies behind all this unrest, uh, all this instability, all this craving, all this desire to make the world your kind of world, which leads to conflict and all of that. All of this conflict, all of these problems are caused by this dart. Dart is always craving in Buddhism. It is hard to see. Yeah, It is stuck in the heart. It is hard to see. This is kind of the... Uh, why is it hard to see? Because, and the reason why it is very hard to see is because very often we enjoy the craving. Yeah? We don't see the craving as a problem. We think craving is something positive. You desire in the world, if you have craving, craving makes life meaningful, right? What would you do if you didn't have any craving? Sit on the backside all day and do nothing? <laughs> craving is what makes the world go round, right? If we crave, that's when we build buildings, we create societies. Without craving, we would just be kind of lying in bed and doing absolutely nothing. Yeah? Mm. <laughs> someone, is agree someone is agreeing with us. <laughs> so this is the problem with craving. Craving, we see craving as something positive because we feel that actually it, en it energizes us. It makes us do things. Yeah, it makes brings the world forward. Yeah? And uh, so we think of craving as our friend. In fact, it goes so far as what we even identify with craving. Yeah? Yeah, we think craving is actually who we are. Yeah? And the reason for that is because a very p important part of our identity as human beings is the sense of being doers, of being creators, of making things in the world. Yeah? I'm sure each one of you in your job, you have to be creative to some extent. Yeah? You have to think of new ways of doing things. And some of you may even be artists, and of course artists are also very much part of uh, the creative activity. Uh, and because we identify with being creators and doers, uh, craving is very closely related to the idea of creation. Without craving, you can't create anything. Uh, so craving feels important, yeah, because I do. Uh, you satisfy your sense of identity, which is the doer inside of you. Uh, and this is kind of what this uh, is about. Uh, and this is why seeing that craving is a problem and seeing that craving is the cause of all of these kind of things is actually very hard because we don't want to see that. So he sees the dart. Yeah? This is the reason why we have so much turmoil in the world. It's all rooted in craving. This is the root problem. 
So uh, stuck in the heart, right? Uh, craving, it feels like it's in the heart. The, the drive, the desires, all of these kind of things. Haddaya uh, nisitang, dudasang haddaya nisitang. Dudasang is hard to see. Haddaya nisitang, stuck in the heart. Uh, when stuck by that dart or craving, you run around in all directions. Uh, but when that same dart has been plucked out, uh, you neither run around nor sink down. Uh, Craving, yeah, tanha dasa, the slave of craving. Craving drives you on in the world. You think you are in charge of craving, but craving is in charge of you. You are the little slave. Craving is the master in her. Is that true? <laughs> it, it feels like we want craving. It feels like we want to be in charge, but actually it's the other way around. Craving is in charge. If you try to rest, if you try to be still, if you try to enjoy the peace of the moment, you can't because craving is more powerful. And craving says, be restless, do more, work harder, yeah. You haven't des you don't deserve to rest yet. And craving is actually in charge. Craving is the boss. Uh, and you are the little slave. And you always say, yes, master. Yeah. And then you kind of run around according to the master craving. Yeah. And that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. When you start to see craving in that way, it kind of loses some of its appeal. Yeah. So how can we know that craving is in charge, that craving is the master? Well, one of the ways of knowing that is to become peaceful in your meditation practice. Uh, and when you become really, really peaceful and you see that craving is gone, only then do you understand the problem of craving, uh, how it makes you agitated, how it makes you restless, uh, and how it is, causes so much suffering for you. That driving on all the time actually is a state of suffering. Uh, but because we identify with it, uh, because we think it is important, uh, because we think craving as, is our friend, it's actually very hard to see it uh, as a state of suffering. Uh, we think of it as happiness. Uh, but remember, I don't know if you, were, if you came upstairs for the, the talk, the public talk today, but one of the sayings I mentioned there is a saying you find in the suttas, uh, that what the noble ones think of as suffering, uh, ordinary people think is happiness. Uh, yeah, ordinary people think that craving is happiness. The noble one says, no, you got it all wrong. It's actually suffering. Yeah. Yeah? And the other way around, what the noble one thinks as happiness, the ordinary people think of as suffering. Yeah? So we get things upside down. Yeah? And the reason we get it upside down is the sense of identity inside of us. Yeah? Once you identify with craving, you have no choice but to think it is a positive thing because it is your identity. Yeah? And then you can't see it for what it is. Yeah? So. You are stuck by that dart, which makes you run around. Yeah, you run around here, run around doing this, and then you eventually you run and run and run. And where do you, where do you end up with all that running? You end up in your grave. Yeah. And then uh, as soon as you get reborn on the other side, you get reborn with little legs, and those legs are already running when you get reborn. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you carry on running in your next life, right? Running again and again and again and again. And it's so on and on it goes, running around in circles, never going anywhere. One of the beautiful words in the suttas is the word is sangsadati and sangdavati, which means basically this eternal going around and around and around, doing the same things over. And the way they have been translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi as roaming around. Roaming, the English word roaming means like movement without destination. Movement without purpose, movement without goal. That's what roaming means. It's like you're roaming the streets of KL at night. It means that you're randomly moving around the streets of KL, yeah? And you're going to be picked up by the police pretty soon if you roam around the streets too much. <laughs> and, uh, and this is our life. When you look at life from a perspective, you stand back like the bird's eye view. We look like these people who roam around without destiny, doing the same things again and again and again, not really going anywhere. Yeah? When you get fed up with that, uh, that's when you become a Buddhist. Uh. <laughs> and then you take a new direction. Okay, enough roaming. Let me have a direction. The Noble Eightfold Path has a direction. Uh. It has a real goal. It has a real purpose. Uh. It is called Sa'atang. Sa'atang is one of the qualities of the Dhamma. Sa'ata means with purpose, with goal, with aim. It's going somewhere. It has a real destination. The destination is called Nibbana. Once you get to Nibbana, there's no more roaming around. You're finished with it once and for all. Uh, if you become, I have bad news for those of you who are Christians. Any Christians here? Okay, I'm going to talk the truth, all right? <laughs> no Muslims, no Christians, no kind of 
Okay, so the, th the problem is, from a Buddhist point of view, if you believe in a creator god, right, uh, and then you get born with that creator god, it is just another rebirth. Uh, it is actually not really an end. Yeah, And this is kind of the problem. I mean, if you are a good Christian, it's wonderful. You're going to have a good rebirth. You, many good things are going to happen to you. But it's not really making an end from a Buddhist point of view. Because that thing that you do next is just going to be another rebirth. And you're going to carry on in a certain way. And this is what kind of distinguishes the Buddhist teachings. And this is, requires the insight into non-self, which is really what is Buddhism, is the hallmark of the Buddhist teachings. It requires that insight into non-self to be able to have a final goal on this path. And that is why these things actually go together. So uh, running around in all directions, roaming around in samsara, now this life, now that life, up and down, sideways, this way and that way, not really going anywhere. And, but then when that heart dart has been plucked out, you pluck out the craving by insight, by overcoming ignorance and getting real understanding of the world, then you neither run around nor sink down. The restlessness is gone. The agitation is gone, but you also don't have the opposite. You don't have the despair, the sadness that comes when your craving is not fulfilled. Yeah? So neither do you have the restlessness, nor do you have the sinking down. Sinking down can mean many things here. It could mean sadness and despair. It could maybe mean dullness and drowsiness, various kind of things. All of that is gone. All right. Okay, so that is the, um, the right view of the Buddha we have been looking at, uh, right? Uh, this is kind of the Buddha to be. This is what he sees before his awakening, according to this. Uh, he gets this fear of the world. They are seeing the danger in the world. This is what is happening here. Uh, and so here, what we have, what we're looking at is kind of the world writ large. Before we look more at the private sphere of life, your personal sphere, the family sphere, but now we're looking at kind of the world in kind of overall context. And when we talk about the world, what we mean is the world of the five senses. That is, what the, that is one of the important meanings of the word world in the suttas. The word, Pali word for world is loka. And the word loka is used in this particular way throughout the suttas. Yeah, so this is kind of the whole world is problematic. Yeah. And uh, I would recommend you when you do watch the news, for example, or you hear about the things happening in the world, the things around us, uh, instead of despairing and being sad, uh, remember that this is what the Buddha was saying about the world. Uh, the world is uncertain. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, it doesn't mean the world is always going to be bad. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good. It's kind of this zigzag. We just don't know what's going to happen. And that is al almost more scary, right? Uh, you have no predictability, no way to know what's going to happen next. Is it going to be the Third World War? Or is it not? Don't know. Is climate change going to be terrible? Or is it not going to be so terrible? Don't know. Is pollution going to get worse or not? Don't know. We just don't know. And this is a big problem. Here. It always goes up and down. And there's always problems in this realm. This is what the Buddha was seeing. Here. This is also known as the Sabbaloke Anabirati Sanya, this non discontent or non delight in the entire world. Here. Because the entire world is problematic. Yeah. Non-delight in the entire world. Uh. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, reject the world. What does that mean? Well, when you reject the world in that way, uh, you go inwards instead uh, and you find the refuge within her. Uh. That is what this is about. Uh. So don't, please don't get sad when I say all these things. Uh. Don't think that these monks, they, well, they make me so depressed. Uh. Because the point is just to guide you in a new direction, right? Uh. This is about right view at the beginning of the path leading to Samma Sankapa. If you get depressed, it's Mitcha Sankapa. Wrong intention. So is anyone getting depressed? Okay. <laughs> so please don't get depressed about this thing. The purpose is not depression. The purpose is to see clearly so we move in a new way. Brainwashing, brainwashing, brainwashing. that's right. Yeah, yeah. The good brainwashing, the Buddha's brainwashing, the Buddha brand. Yeah, the, Number one, the washing powder. <laughs> so that's good. Okay, so now we have seen the problem. 
So once we have seen the problem, we're going to have a very quick look at the solution. This is not really such an important part of this. Uh, I really want to look at right, continue looking at right view, but I'm going to have a quick look at the solution just to kind of go through it, and then we can move on to the next sutta afterwards. Uh, so uh, it then says on that topic, the trainings are recited. So now comes the training that you need to do to overcome the problem. Yeah? So it's kind of nice to have a quick look at it. Uh, Whatever attachments there are in the world, don't pursue them. Uh, having pierced through essential pleasures in every way, uh, train yourself for quenching. Uh, yeah, attachments, gaditani, the things that you kind of hold on to or grasp on to. Uh, yeah, don't pursue those things in the world. This is all the sen five sense world. Uh, having pierced through the sense uh, the five sense world in every way, in other words, having really understood what it is about, uh, you train yourself for quenching. Uh, the Pali word is Nibbana. You train yourself for Nibbana. You can see the word Nibbana down there. Yeah. So you train yourself for quenching. Quenching Nibbana uh, or extinguishment, as we said before, uh, is the extinguishment of the defilements. Uh, and if the world of the five senses is not interesting, uh, you want to give up the desire for that world. That's part of the Nibbana, is the extinguishment of that desire. Uh, and that also then means the extinguishment of the Dukkha, the suffering that comes with it. Uh. So what is that training? Okay, Be truthful, not rude. Free of deceit, rid of slander. Uh. Without anger, a sage would cross over the evils of greed and avarice. Yeah, so these are kind of uh, obvious in many ways. Be truthful, not rude. Free of deceit. Obviously this means deceit in the very core sense, in the sense that you don't deceive other people in the world, right? You're honest and straightforward. And uh, on the spiritual path, the deceit means that you show yourself as you are. You don't try to pretend to be someone you are not. Uh, so, for example, as a monastic, you show yourself. You show yourself with your defilements to your teacher. Your teacher can correct you if you're going wrong. Uh, you're free of deceiving anyone in the world. You are just honest about yourself. Okay, this is who I am. These are my weaknesses. And you don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, you're rid of slander. Yeah, You stop using your mouth in bad ways. Uh, and uh, without anger... A sage would cross over, uh, yeah, so without anger, so giving up anger as well, uh, uh, cross over the evils of greed and avarice. Uh, the idea of always amassing more, always having more. Instead of amassing more, uh, remember what is important in Buddhism is actually to be generous. Uh, one of those nice little suttas that you find, this is found in the Devata Sangyuta, the connected discourses of the Buddha. And in those, there is a sutta which talks about uh, uh, a, me, a simile for uh, the idea of generosity. Uh, and the Buddha says that in a burning house, uh, it is the pot that is rescued from the house that is useful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, all the other pots, they melt in the burning house. They're kind of gone. But the one you rescue out, that is the one that's useful. Uh, in the same way, the, if you have wealth in this world, it is the money or the wealth that you use for generosity, that is the wealth that is rescued. Uh, because that gives you sustenance in the future life. You can use it in the future life as a source of happiness, uh, a source for goodness in the future. Uh, that money, that wealth has been rescued. Uh, the rest uh, goes on to your kids. Uh. <laughs> or it goes to the gov government, or it goes to whatever, right? Uh, but it's kind of not rescued in the sense of making. I'm not saying you should use all your wealth and give it all away. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to balance these things. But you are rescuing your wealth by using it so as to create happiness for the future. It's a nice idea. Let's carry on. Prevail over sleepiness, sloth and drowsiness. Don't abide in negligence. This is the word pamada over here. Yeah. A person intent on quenching uh, would not stand for arrogance. Uh, prevail over sleep and sloth and rather the best way to prevail over those things is one of the best ways is to overcome any anger and ill will you have. Uh, 
It can be hard to overcome these things without overcoming some of the root defilements. So give up some of your anger and ill will, give up some of your greed, and these things come down. Don't be negligent, yeah? or maybe don't be heedless. Don't be, in other words, be careful, be circumspect, think properly about what you're doing. A person who is not careful, circumspect, contemplating their life properly, that is what negligent mean, means here. It means you are being heedless. Heedless is a very nice word in English. Heedless means you're not careful, you're not considering things properly. Always consider carefully. A person intent on quenching would not stand for arrogance. Never be arrogant. Never think that you are better. Never think you are worse. Never think you are equal. You are just a being doing its things in the world. Never really need, no need to compare yourself to anyone in the whole world. Arrogance is uh, not a nice personality trait. Uh, and it's kind of a, it's the ego, of course, that uh, gets in the way when we become arrogant. Uh. Don't be led into lying or get caught up in fondness for form. Completely understand, consist, uh, and conceit, uh, and desist from hasty conduct. Uh. Yeah, again, pretty obvious, don't lie, don't get caught in fondness for form. Well, form is basically the things that we see in the world, that's what form is about. So it's all the things that we see in the world, the forms, the things that we touch, don't get caught up in those things. Yeah, and sometimes this may mean things like other people, we are attracted to other people, that's the form that we are attracted to very often, other people. Completely understanding conceit, yeah, don't, uh, don't have any sense of this uh, inferiority, superiority and equality conceit. Uh, desist from hasty conduct. Uh, and again, this idea, this reminder to be careful in life. Uh, don't be too uh, spontaneous and do things kind of randomly because it leads to problems down the track. Yeah. I'm just going through this fast because otherwise we can take a long time if we can look at all of this in detail. Uh, don't relish the old or welcome the new. Don't grieve for what is running out or get attached to things that pull you in. Don't relish the old. Don't live in the past. Yeah? Don't think, oh, in the past I was so happy. In the past everything was so wonderful. Now everything is going down the drain. No. If you are a true spiritual person, uh, you will relish where you are now because you're practicing well. You have a bright future if you live a spiritual life. Yeah, each one of you here, if you live well, you have a bright future. Uh, and that is kind of what you need to... So forget about the past. The past is gone. Uh, nothing you can do about that. Uh, don't welcome the new. Don't attach to things as soon as they arise. Uh, right? Uh, wow, this is great. N new house. Yay! Attach, attach, attach. And then you have a problem when you start to see the cracks coming in that house. Uh, <laughs> Don't grieve for what is running out, what is disappearing, or attached to things that pull you in. Things are always changing. Leave things alone in the world. Yeah, Have an even mind, this evenness. Go around in the world as someone who doesn't get attached or attracted or repelled by anything. This person who doesn't touch anything in the world leaves the world untouched. Comes into this world, departs. There's no trace left of you. That's the kind of the good thing. <laughs> Greed, I say, is the great flood, and long stand longing is the current, the basis, the compulsion, the swamp of sensuality so hard to get past. Greed is a great flood, yeah, you get driven on by greed. It's this powerful force inside of us, the craving that drags you down, moving downstream through craving. Yeah. Yeah, it's a powerful current that's very hard to resist. And basically this is what we're trying to do on the spiritual path. Longing and greed are similar ideas. We long for something. We long for, yes, finally, that great relationship I've always been trying to find. We long for these things, never really being satisfied. And the longing goes on. And eventually we turn around trying to end the whole idea of greed and longing here. The base is the compulsion, the swamp of sensuality, so hard to get past. The swamp of sensuality. 
This is how it is found sometimes in the suttas, where the Buddha sees a herd of deer. The herd of deer is caught in a swamp. And that swamp is a swamp of sensuality. It is very sticky here. This is very challenging to get heart out of that sensory world. Yeah, it's very difficult because we are so used to it. And actually, in many ways, it is very attractive. Yeah, we enjoy our, we enjoy that world in so many ways. It's easy to forget the downside. That is why it's so hard to get out of. So the swamp, 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 swamp. The bad idea. So um, <laughs> there we are here. The sage never strays from the truth. The Brahman stands firm on the shore. Having given up everything, they are said to be at peace. This is kind of the uh, Buddhist idea. Now we are moving from the path to the result of the path. Yeah? The result of the path is the sage, the Brahman who stands firm on the shore. And of course, this is the full awakening experience. Yeah? This is what happens here. Yeah? But before we do the last part of the sutta, which is the result, uh, maybe this is a good time to stop a little bit, uh, do a little bit of meditation, and just do a little bit of Q&A afterwards. So.
Okay, everyone. So let's uh, just do a few questions if you have any questions. Uh, and then we can uh, take a short break afterwards. Uh, and thank you, Nivern, for turning on the aircon. I feel really happy now, actually. It makes a big difference. Uh, sensual pleasures are not to be underestimated. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> Sukkavada, mm. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, I like that one, Sukkavada, yeah. P please, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, just want to know, because uh, this sutta, right, yeah. from your study, can we, did, uh, can we infer that this has happened before his meeting his teacher, or during his teacher, or after? It's very hard to say. I uh, very difficult to say exactly when it happened. It happened sometime, probably after he left the household life. Maybe even when he was still a householder. Maybe I don't know. You know, that's when it was reflecting on death and all of these kind of things while a householder. Uh, but sometime in that, in that during that time, I would say, uh, probably fairly early on, because he obviously had to have a strong motivation to do what he was doing. So maybe we can say before he met his teachers, Alara Kalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta, probably before, I would, I would guess. But it's just a guess, uh, really. Uh. Yeah. And then the, is the format is like already like uh, having, uh, he knows the uh, asada, or, uh, gratification, danger and nisarana. The, asada, adenava, nisarana, yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. The format, is it, is it like that? Um, is it like that? I would say that here it doesn't talk so much about the asada, the, um, the kind of pleasure in the sense. It talks more about the adinava. I mean, we know about the pleasures already in sensuality. This is what we know way too well, right? I mean, we focus on it all the time, the kind of the gratification of the sensory pleasures. Uh, uh, so really what we need to learn is the adena or the danger, because that actually is very hard to see. You know, this is why people are so attached to the sensory world. It's hard to see that. It goes against the grain. People often reject that. Uh, and uh, so I would say that here what we're seeing is we're seeing mostly the danger, and then we're seeing the path that leads to the, leads to the nisarana, leads to the liberation. And now we're coming into the nisarana, I would agree. So probably here the focus on those two, two I would say, yeah. Anyone else like to say anything here? Yeah. Please, sir. yeah. I'm done. I just wanted to know, maybe a bit related to the other question. How mm. is the suttas actually divided or categorized into before his awakening and after his awakening? Um, they are not, not really categorized like that, but you can tell by the sutta, you know, because the Buddha, he, you know, here he's obviously talking about himself before his awakening, right? He's saying he is fearful and all of these kind of things. So you can know from the context that it is before the awakening. Yeah. In many places he will say so. He will say, before my awakening, while I was still a bodhisattva, while I was still intent on awakening. Yeah. So many places he will say it literally, this was before my awakening, uh, while I was the Buddha-to-be. So there's quite a lot of suttas like that, surprisingly large number. Yeah. And uh, this is what the focus is on this retreat, those particular suttas. Yeah. So usually it is stated outright. Uh, sometimes you have to infer from the context whether it is uh, not, yeah. This table, your table is number one in questioning. This, this table, <laughs> everyone here, ready? <laughs> we should have a <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Sukiyo to Ajahn. I heard that um, uh, amongst all the Nikayas, Kudaka Nikaya has the most corruption. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is true or not. Uh, so how do we... I mean, like differentiate the the true suttas. Yeah. Um, and, and my second question is: uh, are, It's the Kudaka Nikaya fully translated now? Um, because I haven't seen any printed copy. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the corruption, I would say more that it's not so much corruption than late. It's not early Buddhism. It's not the word of the Buddha. It's later Buddhism. That's what I would say. Corruption, maybe not so much, but it's not the word of the Buddha. A lot of it is very obviously not the word, but some of it is commentarial work, like the Nidesa is a commentary on this Atakavaga here. The commentary is in the same section as the same Nikaya as the, uh, uh, as the actual text, which is kind of weird. Uh, so it's, some of it is very late, like uh, the Jataka tales are late. 
the Patisambhidamaga, uh, which is like an Abhidhamma work, is late. Uh, Buddhavangsa, the uh, uh, Buddhavangsa is the um, sequence of the Buddhas. There are 26 Buddhas into the past. That's late. Charyapitika, the conduct of the Buddha, is late. The earliest part of the Kudaka Nikaya are the Dhammapada. This is the, this is the ones you need to know about. These are the most inspiring. And they're very similar to the rest of the suttas. Dhammapada, Udana, Dhammapada, Udana, Itivuttaka, yeah, Itivuttaka, Sutta Nipata we're looking at now, mostly early, some may be a little bit late, but generally early, yeah. Sutta Nipata, so we have Dhammapada, Udana, Itivuttaka, Sutta Nipata, Terigata, Teragata, yeah, the verses of the elder nuns and the verses of the elder monks, yeah, and that those are the six books of the Kudaka that are the earliest part of the Kudaka Nikaya. So focus on those. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to be a fundamentalist, the Buddhist, and so I would say focus on that. But you can also read other things as well, if you have time. Uh, and it can be very enjoyable to read some of the Jataka stories. Yeah? They're nice stories, uh, and they can be enjoyable. But don't think that they are real Dhamma. They're not real Dhamma. Often they are, non, often they are anti-Dhamma. <laughs> I'm serious. Sometimes it's not Buddhist at all. It's kind of really all over the place. And the, some of the idea, like the Visantra Jataka, which is very, very famous in Buddhism, uh, where the Buddha gives away his wife and children, right? You can't give away your wife and children. What kind of morality is that? It's bad, right? This is not Buddhism. We're not supposed to give away our husband or children or wife and children or whatever. That's the wrong conduct. So sometimes it gives a. Comp if you, this is what you learn about Buddhism. And many people in Buddhist countries, like in Thailand or in Sri Lanka, this is what they learn. They think that is Buddhism. It's, <laughs> it's not Buddhism at all. It's something completely different. Uh, and so that's why you have to be careful. So you can read those stories, but you have to take them with a pinch of salt. Uh, yeah? This is kind of very important uh, with those stories. Uh, so uh, that's how you kind of distinguish early and late, roughly. And I think most people would agree with that. You can tell from the style of writing and many, many different reasons why we can know that that is the case. And now I have forgotten your other question. What was the other question again? Uh, the, the publication. But publication. I, but I think a few of these yeah. are already published. The Terigata, Teri, Taragata. All of these uh, are published. All, yeah. all of it published. Yeah, and they can be, uh, they're also available now on suttacentral.net. You can read them directly online now. And you can also order books through that as well. Uh, uh, the rest of the stuff, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother too much reading the rest of the stuff. Maybe the Jatakas, uh, but the rest of the, I wouldn't even worry about it. Uh, you're going to probably fall asleep if you try to read it. It's so, some of it is really boring. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Please, just behind you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Ajahn, just one question about <coughs> reading the sutta. Mm. I'm just referring to this sutta. Sometimes it's hard to know whether the Buddha is uh, saying it as it is or is saying it in met metaphorically. S sorry, can you say again? It's saying in metaphor or saying actually. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So like this case, the peril stem from those who take up arms. Yeah. I can just read this yeah. situation in Ukraine, actually fighting yeah. actual situation. Yeah. Or is it in metaphor? So I, it may be hard to, to really figure out. I, I think the, I think what you have to do, you have to go back to the Pali. The Pali word danda is uh, is more broad than arms. It has the idea of conflict, the idea of uh, punishment, and all of these ideas are part of the word danda. So if you s read the English word, it's probably a bit narrow. But if you understand the full meaning of the Pali word, uh, you get a more proper understanding of what is going on. Uh. So uh, the word danda is it meant metaphorically? I think it's probably meant quite. Weapons, yeah, maybe it's metaphorical as well, the weapons of the tongue, yeah, the spe speaking in a bad way maybe, and that kind of thing could maybe be included. Uh, but I, th I think the, uh, the literal meaning is certainly, is certainly part of this, uh, and maybe it can also be seen metaphorically as well. Uh, so maybe both literal and metaphorical, you can read it in both ways, I think. Yeah. Okay, so for people like me who are not well versed with Pali, I have no hope at all. <laughs> <laughs> No, you have hope. I guarantee you, you have hope. Lots of hope. So you just, uh, just don't, uh, you, you know, you, you get the general idea anyway, right? You get the general idea that arms and these things are, are problematic, yeah? And uh, it is about violence. And uh, this is one of the reasons I like to, to do these kind of things, because I actually 
I can be here to help bring out some of the broader meaning. Yeah, this is kind of the whole point of being a monk, is to actually be able to give these teachings in a way which really people can understand more, more broadly. This is my job, and I'm very happy to do so. So you may ask, can you trust me? That might be your question. <laughs> and uh, I, to that I would say, to that I would say, generally I think you can trust me, but also don't be too gullible. Know that everyone makes mistakes. Uh, no one is going to give you the full teaching. So take what I say. Don't be too skeptical. Yeah, I'm not an, I don't think I'm an evil person. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying deliberately to lead you astray. But also understand that everyone has their limits. Uh, that includes me. Uh, so don't, this is certainly not the final word on the suttas. Uh, but it is one way to help you to understand what is going on. Uh, I think something like that would be the right attitude right, to have uh, when I teach these things. Uh. Thank you. Uh, so let's have a break, everyone. And uh, we'll come back in 15 minutes, sir.